People with multiple sclerosis often avoid going out in the sun because heat can temporarily worsen their symptoms, known as Utah's phenomenon. But believe it or not, there's very significant epidemiologic evidence and evidence based on animal studies that sunlight may be good for multiple sclerosis and is significantly inversely correlated with the risk of multiple sclerosis. Today we'll take a look at some of that research and I'll give my personal recommendations. Let's have some fun. I'm Brandon Bieber and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And if you think this video is informative, please click like. Now, it's been long known that multiple sclerosis risk correlates strongly with latitude. This is a map of approximate multiple sclerosis prevalence. And you can see that in areas such as Central Africa and Central South America, there's much lower prevalence of multiple sclerosis compared to, say, North America and Northern Europe. Now, there may be other factors such as diet and parasite exposure and availability of neurologists, but there's a still a pretty convincing correlation. And if you look within individual countries, you see the same thing. This is a study in Australia and you can see the latitude lines and the approximate incidence of multiple sclerosis in different areas. For instance, in Brisbane, the incidence of multiple sclerosis is only about 2.1 per 100,000, but in Hobart in Tasmanian Island, which is much further south and further from the equator, it's about 8.7. The same is true in the United States. This is a graph looking at latitude versus multiple sclerosis prevalence, and you can see as the latitude increases, and we're in the northern hemisphere, so as you go more north, you're further from the equator, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis also increases, and this has been found in multiple other countries, for instance, England and Sweden. Now, some think that this has to do with vitamin D, and if you want a little bit more information about evidence linking vitamin D and multiple sclerosis, I have a separate video on that topic. You can certainly take a look. But this is a chart looking at vitamin D levels in people who have clinically isolated syndrome. These are people who had a single inflammatory event in the central nervous system, for instance, optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, and are at risk of getting multiple sclerosis, but don't currently meet the diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis. And we're looking at people who have blood levels of vitamin D less than 50 nanomoles per liter or greater than 50 nanomoles per liter. And by the way, if the, you're in the United States, we typically use the units nanograms per milliliter, so this would be about 20 nanograms per milliliter. So we're essentially looking at vitamin D deficiency versus no severe vitamin D deficiency. And clearly, people with higher levels of vitamin D with a dotted line are less likely over this five-year period to develop multiple sclerosis. In other words, to have another attack or have another lesion that makes them meet the diagnostic criteria for MS. We can also look at people who have multiple sclerosis and see who develops more lesions, and people with higher levels of vitamin D, the lower line, develop far fewer lesions than people with lower levels of vitamin D. So clearly, vitamin D level seems to have some sort of protective effect in multiple sclerosis. We can look at this multivariate analysis looking at the risk of multiple sclerosis relapses in various studies. The situs of the bubble is the precision of the study, and clearly there's a correlation where higher vitamin D is associated with lower rates of relapse. But what happens when you actually try giving people vitamin D in a randomized study to see if it actually reduces relapses? This Cochrane evidence-based review looks at five such studies, and they found that giving people vitamin D had absolutely no effect. You can see the odds ratio is centered around one. Now, some of these were smaller studies, and they use relatively low doses of vitamin D, so it's not definitive. But what is going on here? Vitamin D is linked to MS, but it doesn't seem to benefit MS at least not that we can overwhelmingly prove. Well, it's possible that sunlight may be the confounder. Maybe sunlight is what's driving this correlation, and vitamin D is simply related to sunlight. One way to study this is to actually do hand casts to look at the wrinkles in people's skin, which are known to correlate with lifetime sun exposure. So you can see you put this putty on the skin, and you take a photomicrograph, and you count the wrinkles per square inch, and you either have very few wrinkles like this, which means low lifetime sun exposure, or very high number of wrinkles 
wrinkles like this that are deeper that correlate with higher sunlight exposure. A couple of researchers have done this. The woman to the right is Dr. Annetta Langergould, who published this excellent MS Sunshine study. She's also my former fellowship mentor. By the way, if you want to learn about some other legendary MS researchers and their contribution to developing our understanding of multiple sclerosis, I have a video on that that you can check out. But in her study, she found that sun exposure measured by wrinkles is correlated with multiple sclerosis risk, inversely correlated with multiple sclerosis risk in all ethnic groups. It doesn't matter if you're African American. American, Hispanic, or Caucasian, more sun equals lower risk of MS. However, the link between vitamin D and multiple sclerosis is only present in Caucasians, suggesting that maybe sun is the stronger risk factor for multiple sclerosis. Specifically, less sun exposure is associated with greater multiple sclerosis risk. The Aussie immune study in Australia found the exact same thing. Looking at the silicone skin cast score, where a higher score means more wrinkles and higher lifetime sun exposure, we found that people with higher lifetime sun exposure, categories four through six, had about 50% reduced risk of multiple sclerosis compared to people who scored two, or slightly reduced in people who scored three. This is a study looking at sun behavior between ages 0 and 15, believed to be the critical ages for environmental risk factors in multiple sclerosis. And they looked at different countries, Canada, Italy, and Norway, and they did surveys looking at sun behavior and sun protection. So people in clusters 1 and 2 were those who had high sun exposure in the summer but low in the winter. Groups 3 and 4 were people who had high sun exposure throughout the year. And groups 5 and 6 were people who had low sun exposure throughout throughout the year. Also, the even numbers are people who used no sun protection, excuse me, who used sun protection, and the odd numbers, 1, 3, and 5, are the people who did not use sun protection. And you can see group 3, those who had sun exposure throughout the year and did not use sun protection, such as sunscreen, actually had the lowest risk of multiple sclerosis, where the so-called sun avoiders, people who had low sun exposure throughout the year and used sun protection, had the highest risk of multiple sclerosis. This was also found in a study published in the Green Journal. This is the Nurses' Health Study, looking at 151 women with multiple sclerosis versus 235 aged match controls, and they used surveys to estimate cumulative ultraviolet B radiation exposure, and they also corrected for vitamin D supplementation, and they found that people with the highest UV sun exposure had about 46% reduced risk of multiple sclerosis, the odds ratio of 0.54 compared to people with the the lowest sun exposure. So there's a consistent pattern here. So what does sunlight do exactly? What could it possibly do other than influence vitamin D and give you sunburns? It turns out that it has very profound effects on the immune system. And this is actually a specific field known as the field of photoimmunology. It sounds like it's bogus, but there's actually very strong evidence for an effect directly of ultraviolet radiation on the immune system. For example, sunlight stimulates suppressor T cells. These are T cells with the receptor CD25 and they're known to regulate the immune system. The immune system is very complicated in that it regulates itself. Also, sunlight induces some anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-10 and interleukin-4. Interestingly, these interleukins, which are proteins involved in cell signaling in the immune system, are also increased in people with multiple sclerosis who take beta-interferon medications, such as Rebif or beta-seron or Xtavia or Abnix, which are known to treat multiple sclerosis. Also, sunlight induces tolerogenic dendritic cells and causes them to migrate to the lymph nodes, regulating the immune system. Now you may say, well, maybe a lot of this is related to the direct effect of sunlight on vitamin D levels, but it's not. It turns out that mice who are genetically engineered to not have vitamin D receptors, in other words, vitamin D has no effect on the cells of these mice, still develop these same changes in the immune system when exposed to ultraviolet radiation. In other words, they still develop this immunosuppression and immunotolerance when exposed to UV radiation.
Why is that? Well, it turns out there are a lot of lymphocytes and other white blood cells within the skin itself. This is a chart just looking at the different types of cells in the skin and the known proven effects of ultraviolet radiation in these cells. For instance, in the epidermis, there are Langerhans cells and CD4 positive T cells. In the dermis, underneath the epidermis, there are again CD4 positive T cells and dendritic cells and macrophages, and they all have known proven effects of ultraviolet radiation in these cells. And when asked to comment on the association of sunlight exposure and various autoimmune diseases, the researcher Michelle Dumas notes the following things. Ultraviolet radiation reduces Langerhans cells, or histiocytes, within the skin. It also decreases expression of adherence molecules and co-stimulating proteins, which are known to activate T lymphocytes. Also, as I mentioned before, certain anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-10, are increased, and ultraviolet radiation increases the recruitment of dermal macrophages and T lymphocytes that inhibit the immune response. Again, these T lymphocytes with the cell marker CD25. Also, there's a reduction of certain pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-12, which normally activates lymphocyte. And lastly, of course, there is an effect directly of vitamin D3, which suppresses Langerhans cell function. So for instance, if we look at this graph, we can see that ultraviolet radiation does many things. You think about the vitamin D, but it also has this effect on epidermal antigen-presenting cells and various cytokines, as I mentioned. And so there are these very complicated downstream inflammatory changes that really can't be mimicked easily. So sun has a very profound effect on the immune system. Now, I wish there was a randomized study in people with multiple sclerosis looking at ultraviolet exposure, but unfortunately I was unable to find anything. However, we've done several studies in animals, and it looks like ultraviolet radiation does have an effect on an animal model of multiple sclerosis. So this is a study done on rats called experimental autoimmune encephalitis, which essentially is a disease very similar to multiple sclerosis, where rats are artificially induced to have inflammation in the nervous system. System. And we monitor these rats with something called the EAE score, which is essentially a clinical score for the severity of their disability. And you can see that the rats who did not receive ultraviolet radiation did worse. They had higher scores on average, whereas those that received ultraviolet radiation excuse, did better. They had lower disability on average. Now, what if we take away the vitamin D receptor? So this is a brilliant study where they actually genetically engineered rats to not have a vitamin D receptor, to sort of take away the effect of vitamin D from the experiment. And I'll walk with you through this chart. In black, we see the normal rats who had the normal vitamin D receptor, and black is without ultraviolet radiation, and the dashed line is with ultraviolet radiation. So we see the same thing that we saw in the prior graph, that ultraviolet radiation decreases disability in these rats with experimental autoimmune encephalitis. But what about the rats that did not have a vitamin D receptor, the kale or knockout mice? So the gray line is the knockout mice. They had no vitamin D receptor and did not receive ultraviolet radiation. Compare those to the dashed gray line, the rats that did not have the vitamin D receptor but did receive ultraviolet radiation, and you can see that they did much better. So even taking away the vitamin D receptor does not change the beneficial effects of ultraviolet radiation. In other words, there's a vitamin D independent effect of vitamin D of ultraviolet radiation. Now, for whatever reason, the rats without the vitamin D receptor did better overall. I'm not really sure why, and it was not explained in the, ultra, in the article. I should also mention that other research has specifically shown that ultraviolet radiation specifically between 300 and 315 nanometers in wavelength is what's driving this effect. So not the other wavelengths, not normal light, not ultraviolet radiation in other wavelength spectra, but specifically between 300 and 315 nanometers in wavelength. So what are my recommendations? Well, in this book, Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis by Dr. George Jelinek, and by the way, I have a separate summary of the book if you want to take a look at the recommendations in this book overall, Dr. Jelinek 
recommends that you get a brief and regular sun exposure over a large area of the body. Now there's no definitive evidence for this, but I think that based on the epidemiologic evidence and the animal studies, it's reasonable to try to do this. Now of course the sun can be harmful and so you should definitely avoid sunburns, but believe it or not there's evidence that a low level of sun exposure does not really significantly increase the risk of melanoma, although sunburns definitely do, so you should be cautious. And of course the level of sun exposure depends on the time of day, where you live, and your skin tone. If you have type 1 skin like me and live in Southern California and you're going out in the middle of the day, you may need very, very little sun, maybe 5 to 10 minutes. If you have darker skin and live in an area with less sun exposure or it's overcast, you may need an hour of sun. It's very difficult to judge this. So I do recommend this. However, I still do recommend taking vitamin D, and the reason is because there are independent effects of vitamin D that may have a beneficial effect on the immune system, even though there isn't definitive evidence in randomized trials. Anyways, if you have any further questions or requests for future videos, please post in the comments below. And also please mention, do you try to get sun exposure? Do you take vitamin D supplements? And what are your experiences?